Hello there, and welcome back to the Shots in the Quark Special Relativity course. In the last video, we discussed the idea of a frame of reference. A frame of reference is defined by a physical object and is essentially that object's point of view onto the universe. Once we have a frame of reference, we can start to talk about motion. We can say how things are moving with respect to the object that defines the reference frame that we're interested in. One issue that we began to touch upon in the last video, however, is that there are lots of different reference frames that we could measure motion with respect to, but they won't necessarily agree on various things that observers will measure. So an important question we want to address is how we can relate observations in different reference frames, especially when they disagree with one another. We'll go some way towards answering this question in this section about coordinate transformations. Let's suppose we have two reference frames, S and S prime. Now, a good way to visualize a reference frame is to draw a set of coordinate axes. But we should be careful to remember, as we mentioned in the last video, that there is a difference between coordinate axes and reference frames. A reference frame is the point of view of a physical object. Once you have a reference frame, you can pick any coordinate system that you like to measure the motion from that object's perspective. So a reference frame is not a coordinate system because you can pick any coordinate system that you like to label the points in your frame, but you always want to set up a coordinate system in your reference frame because it allows you to describe motion in a quantitative way. So for visual purposes, it's quite useful to represent reference frames by drawing a set of coordinate axes. And that's what we'll do here. As well as drawing the coordinate axes, we can also draw a little arrow representing how fast each reference frame is moving with respect to the other. So in this case, the reference frame S prime is moving at a speed V to the right relative to the reference frame S. The question that we'd like to answer now is how we can relate motion observed by an observer in the reference frame S to motion observed by a different observer in the moving reference frame S prime. Let's use a concrete example. Let's imagine we're at a train station and that we have one person stationary on the station platform and another person traveling on a train carriage holding a tennis ball. In this situation, we can identify two important reference frames. The reference frame S can be the reference frame of the stationary person on the platform and the reference frame S prime can be the reference frame of the person on the moving train. And let's say that the train is moving at a speed V to the right. So we have person S who is stationary on the train station platform and person S prime who is currently holding a tennis ball on a train carriage moving at a constant speed V to the right. Now let's suppose that the person in S prime drops the tennis ball at some time T prime equal to zero. Now what will person S prime observe happening from their perspective? Well, if you've ever dropped something while standing still on a moving vehicle, you'll know that when you release the object, it's just going to fall straight down vertically to the ground. If we label our coordinate axes X prime and Y prime, we can start to quantify the tennis ball's motion. Let's say that at time T prime equals zero, the tennis ball is at the position with coordinates X prime naught, Y prime naught. With this setup and modeling the tennis ball as a projectile, we can write down an equation for its position with respect to time. From the perspective of S prime, the tennis ball will just fall directly to the ground. And so the X coordinate is not going to change. So we can write X prime of T prime is just X naught prime. On the other hand, since the ball is accelerating downwards under the influence of gravity, the Y prime coordinate will evolve like this. Y prime of T prime will be Y naught prime minus half G T prime squared, where G is the gravitational acceleration. So now we've quantified what the motion is going to look like from the perspective of the person on the train. What about from the perspective of the person stationary on the platform? Well, person S is in a different reference frame, and that different reference frame will be using a different set of coordinates. So what we need to do in order to work out what S observes is to work out what this motion looks like in terms of the coordinates that S is using. In other words, we need to use a coordinate transformation from the variables used in S prime, 
x prime, y prime, and t prime to the variables used in s, x, y, and t. What we have at the moment is the equation of motion for the tennis ball from the perspective of the person in s prime on the train, but what we want is to know what the equation of motion is from the perspective of the person on the platform in s. We have the equation of motion in x prime, y prime, and t prime coordinates, the coordinates of the person on the train, but if we want to know what the person in s on the platform observes, we need to turn these into an equation of motion involving x, y, and t unprimed, because these are the coordinates of the person on the platform. Okay, well that sounds all well and good, but how do we know what coordinate transformation is the appropriate one to use? The answer depends on what exactly the laws of physics actually are. An appropriate coordinate transformation is one that preserves the form of the laws of physics. In Newtonian physics, the laws of physics are Newton's laws, and so an appropriate coordinate transformation must preserve the form of Newton's laws. The transformations that do achieve this are known as the Galilean transformations. In the situation that we're currently working with, they look like this x is equal to x prime plus v t prime, y is equal to y prime, t is equal to t prime. On the left hand side we have the coordinates of the person on the platform, x, y and t. On the right hand side we have expressions in terms of the coordinates of the person on the train, x prime, y prime and t prime. If you wanted to, you could show rigorously how these transformations preserve Newton's laws, but we won't do that here. Instead, let's go back and apply this to our train station example and work out, finally, what it is that the person in reference frame S will observe. First, let's redraw the situation from the perspective of the person on the platform. We already know the equations of the motion in S prime, their X prime equals X prime naught and Y prime equals Y prime naught minus a half G T prime squared. To work out the equation of motion from the perspective of the person in the reference frame S, we can use the Galilean transformations that we wrote down above. Substituting what we found in S prime into our Galilean transformations, we find that in S we have that x is equal to x naught prime plus v t prime, y equals y naught prime minus half g t prime squared, and t equals t prime. From this last equation, t equals t prime, we can replace the t primes in our equations for x and y with t's. If we assume that in the frame S the tennis ball starts off at the position with coordinates x0 and y0 instead of x0 prime and y0 prime, then we can also just get rid of the primes on the x0 and the y0 in our equation. So what does the motion of the tennis ball look like from these two different perspectives? Well, remember from the perspective of S prime, the ball just moves vertically down. To work out what person S observes, we can combine these two equations that we found for x and y, eliminate t, and we find that what we have is the equation of a parabola. From S's perspective, the tennis ball doesn't just fall vertically downwards, it forms a parabolic shape. Hopefully, this is exactly what you expected, since from the perspective of the person on the platform, the tennis ball doesn't just have a vertical component of velocity straight down, but also a horizontal component of velocity due to the motion of the train itself. So this example by itself may not have told us anything profound about the way the world works, but the process that we've just been through is one that we can use in special relativity and it's going to be enormously helpful. So let's summarize this process. Suppose you have two relevant reference frames, S and S prime. Let's also suppose that you know the equations of motion or you know how an object is moving from the perspective of just one of these frames then you can work out what the motion looks like from the perspective of the other frame by using an appropriate coordinate transformation. Now, one important thing to realize when you're comparing motion between two different frames is that some aspects of the motion will look the same in both frames and some will look different. For example, in the situation we just looked at, the time taken for the tennis ball to fall to the ground of the carriage will be the same for both observers, whereas the shape of the trajectory that each person will see is different. One sees the ball fall vertically downwards, the other sees it trace out a parabolic path. 
At this point, we can already state what the main difference between Newtonian physics and special relativity is going to be. In Newtonian physics, the appropriate coordinate transformations to use are the Galilean ones. And Galilean transformations will always leave things like duration, that is time taken, length, and simultaneity the same for all observers. That is, all observers are going to agree on how long a process takes, how long an object is in space, and also whether two events occur at the same time. All special relativity is then, is just the realization that the appropriate coordinate transformations for our universe are not the Galilean ones, but a different set entirely. And when we use these transformations to compare motion in two different reference frames, we find that lots of things that we used to think everyone agreed on are actually now different. That'll do for this video. And actually, this is all we need to know conceptually in order to start doing special relativity properly. The last section of this preliminary chapter will just be about the basics of matrices, which are a useful mathematical tool for studying relativity. So thank you very much for watching, and I hope you found this interesting and useful. See you on the next video.